Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this special edition of the Big East Rewind. Today, our show is all about the most electrifying player in the Big East in the 80s, Dwayne the Pearl Washington. And my co-host, as always, was a teammate of Pearl's, number 23, the great Sonny Sparrow. How are you, Sonny? I'm good, Chuck. I'm looking forward to today's show. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. I'm glad you were able to get it all together and Janie and, and the fellows are all good to be here. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. You know, we've always talked, you know, it seems that the one player, Sonny, in, in, in the big East that comes up the most since we've been doing, we're up to somewhere around 50 shows now. And the one name that continually comes up is Pearl, you know, and everybody's got a story. Everybody's got, you know, uh, something to say about the guy. And uh, he, he was, you know, he was, you know, one of a kind, you know, on and off the court. And we figured, why not? Why not bring the people in that knew him the best to talk about his life? Kind of like what we did with Coach Massimino, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and dedicate the show to uh, to Pearl Washington. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel today. And we've got quite the panel. First, we've got Pearl's sister, Janie Washington Bennett with us, his older sister. How are you, Janie? Good to oh, have you, you had with to us. say that, his oldest sister. <laughs> well, his two oldest sisters. Sister. <laughs> I didn't say it. I know. Notice Sonny, Sonny, Sonny jumps right and throws me right under the bus, man. Just, I want to be clear. I didn't say it. <laughs> I didn't say it. So that's it. That's Sonny's thing. Uh, Sonny, so. you said that? <gasps> no. No. See? No. I don't support it either. <laughs> All right. Also, All right. hey, listen. Also, when he was born, I was a teenager, so yes. Okay. okay. There you go. Also joining us is Pearl's high school coach from Boys and Girls High School, Paul, Coach Paul Brown. Paul, how are you? Oh, fine. You. Thanks for having me tonight. Oh, thanks for joining us. I mean, this is really going to be fun when we start getting into all this stuff, you know. And uh, we appreciate you coming out. I, you know, and we'll get into. Uh, what you're doing too in, in a minute. And also with us today is Pearl's backcourt mate. Also went, he went to uh, St. Bonaventures and played his college career in St. Bonaventures. New York City legend, Elmer Anderson is with us. How are you, Elmer? Hey, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, Chuck and Sonny, thanks for having me. I um, appreciate uh, Jane reaching out and you guys reaching out to me. Uh, I, I think this is gonna be, uh, you know, something special and uh it's always a pleasure when it when it's a discussion about uh the wayne and everything oh. so uh, i'm looking forward to hearing everybody else's stories as well absolutely and you and i you and i have uh swapped some yes. sweat on the floor from time to yes, time yes. moment back in the yes, day indeed. i remember you were on that mm -hmm. great uh newsday classic team in the city that mm -hmm. beat the crap out of us on long island at the yeah. nassau coliseum i'll and never forget that coach. man and coached by Coach Brown, too. And Coach Brown. Well, yeah, thank coach. you both for the. Thank you both for that. That was very humbling, I have to tell you. <laughs> so, also, we have another New York City legend from Queens, Syracuse legend, teammate of Pearls, the great Wendell Alexis is joining us. How are you, Wendell? I'm great, guys. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, oh, man. So that's our panel for today. We're going to, and we're going to talk about, you know, the show is dedicated to, uh, to Pearl, his, his, his life and uh, his basketball career. And why not start it off with his big sister, Janie? How was it growing up? Where did you guys, <laughs> how was it growing up with him as a little kid? How, what was he like? He was a, very shy. I mean, he wasn't, he was pretty much what, He's a prankster though. He's really a prankster. He liked to play around and make jokes and stuff like that. But he was basically just a nice little kid. He was. I mean, he didn't, he, you know, we grew up in Brownsville and yep. Brownsville it was tough, but he didn't have to deal with that because he was a player. And those things are kind of, and, and he had my other brothers to kind of protect him. So he really didn't face a lot of the same issues some of the other kids had to face because he had he had brothers and family that was very supportive of him. But he was quite 
quite something to deal with when he was younger. I mean, he grew up to be such a different young man, but as a kid, oh, what a prankster. He would do all kinds of silly things, but he was always good. His heart was always good, yeah. basically. What, so, what were, so, what were some ahead, of the sorry. things that he was into? I mean, I know basketball. Was he, was he, did he play like strict stick ball? Was he uh, like a wiffle, like baseball or any other sports like that? No, he wasn't really too much of a other player i guess he found his niche yeah you know like when you find something and um and uh, my brother um beaver also helped kind of direct him in that area i don't know if we we didn't really we found out that he was so good at such a young age so why mess with it with any other sport you know yeah. he just played what he was best at you talked about he was good at a young age. I, I read I read somewhere that uh, playing in the Howard uh, housing projects at eight years old, that's where he got the name Pearl, right? Somebody somebody came up and said, who do you think you are, the Pearl? Is that how that worked? <laughs> well, you know, originally it was Pac-Man. Right. And that was, that, originally, that was the original name because when he played, he was just packing all the balls and, you know, that was the name. And then all of a sudden, Pearl came out because he was so good at it. They, again, who do you think you are? Right. So, Coach, talk about now, you know, he's, he goes to middle school and then you got him. In, you got him in high school. But where did you, you know, where did you first meet him? And, and how did that how did that interchange go? Oh, the ironic thing about the situation with Pearl is that I was the last one to know about Pearl was coming to Boys and Girls High School. Actually, Pearl went to another high school uh, his freshman year, and then he transferred over to Boys and Girls as a sophomore. So all the kids needed to say on a team. To, actually, I got Pearl my second year as a high school coach at Boys and Girls High School. My first year, the players we did fairly well, and then the players at the end of the season tell me this big Pearl was coming to the high school. I said, there's only one pro that I know. That was Earl of Pearl Monroe. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, Pearl? I said, who is this kid? So once after he got back in school in, school in his sophomore year, he started practice. I saw why they called him Pearl. He was, he was fantastic. And um, he was a sophomore. And they would say we had a veteran team coming back from the previous year. We was 24 and two my first year at Pokemon at Boys and Girls High School. And a lot of the kids was coming back. So needless to say, my loyalty was to them. So I told Pearl that, you know, you're coming off the bench this year. But as a sophomore, coming off the bench, he led the team in scoring, uh, rebounding, and assists. So he was that good as a sophomore, but I just kept him on the bench because of the, the place we had from the previous year. I'll, I'll, let me ask Elmer the same question. When did you and Pearl get together? Uh, you know, it's ironic. It's during gym class. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know him uh, at all because, uh, basketball, I was just really picking up on basketball and coach, you know, coach Brown was, was, was one who definitely encouraged me, uh, to, to play, uh, at, a, at that level. But, uh, I ran across Pearl one day, like I said, in gym class and, uh, you know, it was, it was right then and there, you know, just like, I was like, wow, I said, this guy, this guy can play. And everything and yeah you know, i guess the, you know, the old saying we all heard like players no players you, you know when somebody can hoop but i'm laughing inside with coach brown <laughs> coach brown said you know he did have Dwayne coming off the bench but that was like two minutes into the first quarter the <laughs> 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 way was the way was being subbed right in so he wasn't on the bench too long and everything but uh but coach, coach wants to keep his happened. job. He's no joke. He yeah, wants to yeah, keep his yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was my first time meeting him. Meeting him was uh, during gym class. Well, let me just add something to that story. Um, as I said, Elmo was probably right. I guess I think it was close to women. Elmo, the other two minutes after the game started, he came in and got into the game. He got into the game. He played the game basically the entire game. As I said, he led the team scoring the Iowa Mansion Hall City. As I run at the end of his um, sophomore year, at the end of the season, I said, well, I, I call him Dwayne. Sometimes I call him my son because my son's name is Dwayne and his name is Dwayne. So I said, son, 
I guess maybe next year you'll be coming off the bench again. But I said, no, you'll start next year. So he's there. She said, no, coach, let me come off the bench again. I said, no, son, you're starting next year. Definitely his junior year. So that was it. So he needs to start and the rest is history after that. So, so let me ask you, so you got this, this young man in your gym and he's got this special talent and he's got this special electric personality. Um, what were some of the things that you looked at as a coach says, how can I, how can I help him or how can I, you know, uh, help him, you know, mold or get him, you know, to, to excel even further. That's gotta be a challenge when you're dealing with great players. It's a little bit of a challenge. What do you think? Well, okay. coach? I, I concur with you 100% on that. It was a challenge in terms of making him better. And I challenged him at the end of each, at the beginning of each season to be the best possible player. So at the end of his junior, just so I could move forward, at the end of his junior, I challenged him to be the best player in the country. And I think eventually he worked real hard over that summer and he eventually came back much improved. Now, needless to say, uh, he can do anything on the basketball court, dribble, pass, and sh shooting is that he's an underrated shooter. He shot the ball really well for us. He shot over 70, 65%, if I'm not, not mistaken, as a senior. And he shot the ball really well. And uh, I, you know, it's just a matter of challenging him to do better, you know? And, you know, we, we give him various challenges to do, and he succeeded in all the challenges that we gave him. Elmer, what what were what were you thinking? Now you you're playing alongside him. What what was you know what was <laughs> what were you thinking? What were you seeing as your role, and how was that going to work out? Well, you know my role, like like Coach said, uh, you know as a sophomore, uh, he was loyal to uh, the other players, and I was just 13 years old, and I'm on varsity at 13, so I was just happy to be there, but I knew I belonged and everything, uh, uh, just skill wise, but you know, the thing that I remember most, you know, it's funny that coach says he gave, he gave Pearl challenges. Yeah. We gave him challenges too. make the time on the suicides. That <laughs> dude always had, he always had us running extra and every time, you know, every, every, not, not every practice, but often and everything. But Dwayne was, uh, you know, a motivated dude when it came to like competition and he wanted to just uh, separate himself from everybody. And it was, you know, he did it in a flawless manner where it just looked, you know, a lot of people were amazed at how he, you know, how he would go about doing it. And even as a teammate, you know, sometimes, you know, I would I would get caught up in it. But one of the things Coach Brown and Coach Carroll always said, hey, listen, don't be standing around just looking at what he's doing. You know, make yourself, put yourself in a position to uh, maximize, you know, what talents you have in Pearl. I, I say it to this day. I can be anywhere on that court, man. That dude would pass me the ball, you know, uh, uh, because he was always being doubled and triple teamed. And uh, all I would do is just go spot up somewhere and just, you know, hey, listen, I'm sure Wendell can tell you the same thing. All you got to do is just spot up and he get the ball and you just, you just shoot it. You know? He's very but unselfish. Wendell can tell you about the suicides too, because <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I he was can. just going to say that. He had the worst hammies at any point guard I ever knew. Anytime it came time to run, hamstrings start hurting. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Ice bag. Ice bag. Well, let's, let's just say he wasn't a practice player. I think we can establish that, right? The guys that played with him. I mean, no, no, no. He was, a, he was a practice player. When it came, when it came to running, mm -hmm. he didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, back, and, back in the, and back in those times, especially in the, in, in, in the early 80s, we were, we spent, we, we were, we were, we were, we were attack teams. Right. We spent a lot of time on conditioning running. By 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 beginning of November, I think we had better times than our track team. Because everybody, <laughs> everybody, everybody was, you know, running two times, three times a, a, a practice, a workout. And we had a rule, if you didn't make a time, you had to make you had to make a time at the end of the workout. And this was under the guise of a class, the Bayheim Club. Yeah, right. yeah. So, but before I just want to say, but when he was in high school, I remember going with him to a game, and when he walked in the court, the place went crazy. There were people in the tree waiting for him to come. It was <laughs> like, I, you know, here's my little brother. I say, what is this? They were yelling and whooping and hollering, 
and he showed up. He yeah. was great. When did that I start, mean, Janie? That type of that type of adulation for him? Really, when when he was in high school, because he would go to all the different parks and play and stuff like that, play with the different teams. And when he went, they say showtime, and we knew what that oh. meant, right, Coach? And this was probably you know, probably and he's probably referring to the summertime because that's when they had all the summertime. and everything. So that was before he even started in high school. It's the feedback on what Wendell was talking about suicides. I know a couple of times he said to everyone who runs in, the first guy who finished sometime would get off the next couple of ones. Bro, would never be the first one. And sometimes we count that the last person will, will not run, but everyone else on the team will run because of the last person on the team because we're trying to up immunity for everybody. And sometimes the last person was, as is always, was Pearl. But, you know, he's very, very, he's very deceiving. He wasn't fast, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. very well, quick. I know one thing, I know one thing Coach. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was go ahead. saying the one, yeah, I was saying the one thing in terms of him being deceptive, but he used to get a lot of us, we used to get, a lot of us used to get upset. And one time, one of the players on the team, and when I say upset, like, not where it was like, ah, but upset because, you know, they would, we were tired of doing the extra running. So one time someone put some Ben Gay in his jock strap. And everything. <laughs> so that, and I remember, yeah, listen, it was one of the funniest moments. Coach never knew this. Yeah. Was when Pearl, Pearl got upset when he, when he realized it. He's running around the locker room chasing, you know, chasing who had did it. And it was just a hilarious moment. And it was like, yo, I bet you'll make the time now, but it was a, it was a funny it was a funny right. it was a funny moment. But uh, Frank just to see him running, yeah, yeah, to see him running around in his jock strap chasing another teammate. That was like a funny. That was a hilarious moment for. We you had know, you, you mentioned his deception, you know, on the court as somebody that's played against them. I never got the opportunity to play with them, but I played against them numerous times. Mm -hmm. it, it was deceptive to me because it always looked like he was going to fall over. He had, he was like leaning forward and therefore he was so low to the ground with his crossover and anything he did with the ball, the ball was just part of his hand and it didn't matter if he went right or left or, and, and it was, it was amazing because the best guys in the league. And when we played in the big East, I would say, you know, one of the best, if not the best guy, when we were playing defensively was Gene Smith from Georgetown and Pearl always got the better of Gene, you know, the bigger, the challenge, the bigger, the bigger, the, uh, the brighter, the, the light, the, the bigger, the highlight, <laughs> you know? He, yeah. So I just think he, he had that, that stagger. Like he was, you know, almost looked like he was kind of jogging all of a sudden he just turned it on and was lightning quick. And he was back by you and got his way to the basket for the layup always. Yeah, was, was he like that? Did he, did he develop that in the park, Elmer? Or did he, you think he developed that there? Or is that something that just came I, naturally? I, I think it was just a, a natural gift because I used to actually try to mock. Well, Coach Brown used to be insistent on me trying to copycat what, what Pearl would do with the crossover and things of such. And I, and I added it to my game. But the thing that I enjoy when I, when you speak about crossover, the, I still remember the game against Camden. It was Billy Thompson, Note Wagner, yeah. Kevin Walls, and it was the greatest game I ever seen him play. And this was our junior year, and we were at Camden. The bus got there late, and we thought the bus driver was trying to make us late for the game on purpose. So we get there, and we really didn't even have a chance to warm up. Uh, uh, and, but the gym is packed, and this dude goes out like he was in his own backyard and he just went out and just put on a show. He shook the whole team. Well, you know, 80% uh, uh, of the team, that other 20 just happened to be Billy Thompson standing underneath the basket. And that's the first time I ever saw Pearl dunk. He crossed over, shook everybody and went up and dunked it off two feet right on Billy Thompson head. Yeah. And from that point on, they were number one in the country, I believe, from that point on. In the, that, the entire, the entire Camden crowd cheered for him when every time he came up the court with the basketball. It was one of the greatest moments that I had seen at that level, you know, at a, as a high schooler. So yeah, that, that doesn't happen. No. Mm -hmm. 
it doesn't like happen. You, you knew you, you knew you was part of something special. That's yeah. all I can say. Yeah. Well, let me add a little something to that game since I'm gonna pull it up. So, well, Cameron was number one in the country, as Elma said, he had all these three future NBA players on the team. And ironically, you know, Billy Thompson was his teammate in, in the Miami Heat. So I guess, you know, Pro used to give it to Billy Thompson a lot, you know, in the locker room in the Miami Heat because uh, you know, we keep him at Camden because Camden was number one in the country and Camden never loses at home. And what happened was that and the thing as great as he was offensively, he was just as great to me personally as a coach, because defensively, because I think Billy Thompson was killing us in the first half time at Camden and at halftime. He said, Coach, let me get Billy Thompson. Let me get Thompson. Let me get him. Get him. And he yeah, yeah. in the second half and that kind of on the whole game. I think I think he his scoring was like I think he only scored 25. I think Elmo had like 37, 39, something that game, Elmo. Yeah, that was you called that my coming out party. Yeah, that was That's his coming Elmo's well. coming out party. I think he scored 39 and Pro scored 25. But what made the game so great was that, that we held down Kevin Wall. We had Billy Thompson. And they had one other foot. Mel Wagner. Mel Wagner. Mel Wagner. Yeah. Mel Wagner was great for the Los Angeles Lakers. And we beat them at Camden. You just don't beat wow. Camden at Camden. One of the best games he played. But, but most yeah. of like I said, it was about the, the defense. greatest game, game I've ever seen him play. Just yeah. to share just the energy, just the energy that that crowd had just standing up when he had the ball in his hand. Every possession. And, uh, I, you know, sometimes you see things like that happen nowadays, but just at that time, and at Camden, you know, used to be, you was able to smoke cigarettes, you know, when in, in gyms or whatever. And I remember us walking in that gym and it was so cloudy from <laughs> smoke, people smoking at the top. It, it was insane, but it was a fantastic game. And uh, that's mm -hmm. when I, I realized, man, this dude, he just was different. He's just different. Yeah. When, when he got the ball in college, you 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 felt like uh, all of a sudden you're right. People stood up, and he wasn't even at half court yet. There was already the momentum. It was already like, let's watch and see. Let's see what happens. Because there's and a highlight of, coming. That's right. Yeah. And one of, one of the funniest things is like he would go at guys like you know you know uh, Eddie Pinkney and Pearl and, and Patrick Ewing, and these guys would be frozen. And he would just lay and, and me like these guys weren't blocking shots and I don't they weren't watching but they weren't making a move. He had a way of freezing the defense like I've never seen, and it was inside and outside. It didn't matter, you know. I mean, Wendell, what were some of the things that you remember? I remember him going at these guys and they were just like they didn't have an answer. No, I mean my my experience with Pearl. I think one of the first times we played together with Empire State games, oh, yeah. uh, and you know I was we were still in. Um, we were, we were in a, was I, in, I, no, I was in high school. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, and again, no one, no one in hearing of his reputation, of course, that I'm playing in the Catholic school and he's playing public school. And so basically the way you, if you, if you can see a game, great. Most of the time you you follow and stuff through the daily news. Through the daily news, yeah. Mm -hmm. The old travel. Reading it through the paper and the the uh, the next time we had our shows and so we're playing outside at Rucker I remember Walter Berry's on our team me Pearl and don't ask me who else because <laughs> it was just after basket you know as Jeannie said um you know the 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 park was full people people are hanging over the the rails then you look up at the top of the building you see a crowd on the roof I mean 20 stories up I'm like who can you, how can you tell who's who? And like you said, you know, it was electric, uh, electric atmosphere. One of the things that we were talking about Pearl's attributes, he, one of the things I think that made him as good, he had great feet and balance. I mean, the way he shifted his body, the way he changed direction laterally. I mean, he wasn't the fastest, he wasn't the fastest in a straight line, but side to side, mm -hmm. you couldn't stay in front of him. I mean, we talk about Gene Smith, who's probably, you know, built the same way, low to the ground, hard to get around, tough player. And Pearl, you know, Pearl can, with his head, look one way and his body's going the other way. And that's that's the thing. I think that's one of the things, you know, as as 
as players, we're always taught defensively, oh, look at his chest, look at the middle of his body. That's the worst place to look at Pearl. <laughs> you, don't wanna, you don't wanna look at him there, you know? You don't wanna look at him there because it's, it's gonna lie to you. It's gonna lie to you. And body control is another thing. You know? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a feeling of helplessness when you're, when you're, as Sonny mentioned earlier, when you're back there you're and he's coming full speed, you, you're like, oh, damn, what am I going to mm -hmm. do now? I mean, I, I I played against him in the Maurice Stokes game up in up in Kutch's, and uh, mm -hmm. I found myself in that position. I said, this this is not going to end well for me. You know, I'm just glad I didn't fall down when he made the shot. And then he smacked me on the backside and kept running the other way with that smile. <laughs> yeah. he was, oh, anytime he made a move, that was like a mm -hmm. trademark, man. He, yep, right. he had a big, he flashed a big smile like, what are you going to do? You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it was just He's it was really that. unbelievable, you know, how he, he was, was able to do that. He was having so much fun that oh, that was yeah. another part of that infectious personality that he had. Yeah. And like Jamie said, he was shy. I'm glad to hear that because he was kind of shy and humble too. Now, I'm a country bumpkin from upstate New York, and I'm playing with <laughs> Pearl, right? And, and we can't be from two different, more different parts of the area. And he had a, some similar characteristics, but his privacy was important. He was super humble. He wasn't what you would imagine this superstar kid is. You yeah. ju he just wasn't. And it's, it, you know, it was special. I mean, the things he did, like Wendell said, he'd go left and right. He'd be like, oh, man, forget it. See ya. Janie, I want to go back a second to um, when he started getting recruited by every, I imagine everybody and their brother was at the house talking to you guys, right? Yes, yes. What was that process like? Uh, to, to witness number one and number two what was talk to us about and coach jump in when you when you see fit how did he get from Brownsville to Syracuse <laughs> you know he, there were a lot of people trying to recruit him it was crazy um, people wanted him to come and visit different places and stuff but he was kind of set in his way about where he really wanted to go. And I guess Coach Behan was the one that, and, and maybe Coach Brown kind of directed him in a way that made Syracuse his best choice. But it was it was crazy. We lived in a project and these people coming all the time, want to talk and want to, you know, trying to get him to come to and visit their schools and things like that. But he was kind of set in a way about what he wanted to do. And he, he, uh, looked, he looked good. In he looked yeah. good in orange. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Not to me, he didn't look like, good. Like, in like Janie does right now. See, she got color on. There you go. Looks That's good right. in orange. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, so you know I'm curled I up. I guess it was the way. There we go. There you go. He's got it. There Boys you go. Girls. All right. Oh, Coach okay. Brown, talk to us. Coach Brown, talk a little bit about that recruiting process because at that time the high school coaches were more involved than right. I. Right, I was about to say that at the time, basically every coach in the country seemed to be calling me, yeah. as well as in the calling the parents. Well, I don't know if they call the parents. Not, the, not that much. All times of night, some guys is calling me up at twelve o'clock. Hey, coach, I'm just calling just to wrap you. Just to, how are you doing? How is everything going? I just said twelve one two o'clock in the morning. They were out on the West Coast, so they don't you know there's a three hour time difference. But basically, I guess I think he was after all the coaches that came out to all of the East, he wanted to go to the Big East because I think when it was at this, also the Big East was getting bigger and bigger and bigger at that time. And so we had all the every coach in the Big East, had, not, not the assistant coaches, the head coaches. John Thompson came out to Boys and Girls High School, Goldie Massimino. Um, I forgot the doctor was at Boston College at the time. Um, seen Hall's head coach over here. I forgot who it was now. All the head coaches. PJ Calissimo. Yeah. yeah. Well, but Coach, yeah. he didn't go to a lot of, he didn't visit a lot of colleges. No, no, he no, no. Go. I'm just saying that the head coaches came to the school. Yeah, to the school. To he didn't do a lot of visiting either. What he school did he visit, Jamie? One of the things he went, like I have to say, I think with St. John's University, one coach of, uh, on the second was very interesting, for all needless to say. And uh, actually, we took a visit to St. John's. And what happened was that uh, myself, Pearl, and Diva, which is going to other, we went to St. John's and we took uh, a car. 
And we all, one question I had, and this, I guess this was the whole visit. I said, Coach Klein said, are you going to run? Are you going to walk all, all up the court? He said, well, we'll take opportunity breaks. And once he said the opportunity breaks, I ended up at St. John's University right there at the end. And I guess also Sergio came in to play a lot. But, you know, as Wendell could tell you, he played in the Empire State games every year as an underclassman. Then it with the open team, and he fell in love with Syracuse. Yeah. So that, that, I do. Mm -hmm. You had something to that too. You knew you probably talked about doing the recruiting process. How did it go with between you guys? Well, well, one of the things that I I remember because again, you know, this was all becoming, you know, real new, and this was exciting and everything. And I used to when he came back from his visit, I'll never forget when he came back from NC State, and uh, yeah. he visited, and he was like, "Yo, you know," he was, and usually Dwayne. You know, he, he laid back with his expressions of certain things. He was like, I walked into the gym and it was like starting at guard, number of the <laughs> lights and music came on and everything. So I remember that that's one thing that I did remember with him, with his recruitment. He said it was awesome when he went and visited NC State. He said yes. it was like, it was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so... You know that's that's one of the recruiting things, but uh, he pretty much was had his mind made up, as Jamie mentioned. Uh, you know, and they I guess Syracuse sold. You know, did a good job. Bayham did a good job selling that Carrier Dome. You know, of course Manly Fieldhouse, but the Carrier Dome. You're gonna be playing in there, and it was just it was just insane. Considering the same thing he was doing in front of three thousand people, now he's doing it in front of thirty thousand or whatever, whatever it held. So. You know, it, it was meant for him to be there. It, it was mm -hmm. it was meant for everyone to get a chance to enjoy the special qualities and the excitement that he that he provided. And uh, it was uh, he 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 packed that place. He, I tell you one thing: a lot of a lot of cable cable companies uh, uh, started hiring a lot of a lot of people after him <laughs> because uh, because yeah. of all the excitement that he would bring mm -hmm. in sponsorships and everything. So. And you know my man Wendell, you know he's up there, and of course, Sonny, you're there. So you guys, you guys saw it and understood it. But I always look back, and I just, and I just say, I, I say it between him, you know, uh, um, you know Mullins and them dudes, man, they're the ones who, they got, yeah. and, and Patrick, and Pick, they got a lot of people jobs, man. They got a lot of people jobs. Cable TV became real popular. Yeah, that's the piece. That's the piece true. At the time, the piece was up and coming. At the I mean, uh, I know it's a little side note. I know one time I went to Madison Square Garden with uh, I, no, no, Andre Hawkins and his coach Hank Williams was there and he okay. started talking about how, how much Andre loved Syracuse and everything. And um, and he took me to coach take a you know, take a visit up to get to begin. So, you know, he had a lot of different stories on the side as well. Uh, that was very important in his recruitment. You know, you know and Andre Hawkins and became good friends, especially if the Empire State games, you would battle on the court, fight each other, hand and foot. Then after the game, they're dicking, beat, having pizza and sodas, and just like nothing happened. I think one time Andre Hawkins checked for all during the course of the game. And then after the game, they were just buddies, it's like nothing happened. So it was kind of very interesting. You know, I think, you know, did you play on the open team, Empire State games? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. So uh -huh. you know, yeah. Yeah. I, I was on those teams, Wendell. Don't forget me, Wendell. I was on them teams. <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. One yeah. Thing, I know one thing. Andre Hawkins. He didn't keep his room clean. Shit. Oh. I tell you. Oh my goodness. He invited. They invited all the players. We all went up to his room. Like, oh my goodness. I was like, let's get up out of here. But but <laughs> Andre, Andre, <laughs> Andre had, uh, was a great guy. Well, at about two months of laundry on the floor. I live three doors oh down from him. So, oh, my, so, my God, man. I know. So I have a question for, for both Wendell and Sonny because you you guys were there uh, when this all went down. So now Pearl takes this big reputation with him, and, and the talk is he's coming to Syracuse, and one day he's on campus, and everything changed, like you guys had just mentioned. Not only uh -huh. the Big East. The basketball program changed. There was a lot of excitement generated. I remember being on campus during our time when we were playing you guys and you walk down Marshall streets and you can get, there's a shirt of Pearl spinning a basketball on his finger, sitting on top of the dome 
on the seventh day, God created the pearl, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, and, and one mm-hmm. of the biggest attributes when you, when you think about pearl and, and coach B has said this a million times and, and from being around them as much as I've, I've been around them and you guys have been around them more than me, but his, his humbleness was just came shining through his whole personality because any other guy, you know, that had that kind of adulation before he even stepped on the floor. It was like, it was kind of like Pearl mania, uh, you know, at, at Syracuse. Talk about what that was like, Sonny and Wendell. What was, what, how did it change? How did the, how did the place change when he came onto campus? Well, I will tell you this. I'll, I'll tell you this and I'll let Wendell answer. My, my thing he went. He was on national TV with Al McGuire when he made his decision. Okay, and that was unheard of. Yeah. But he was that big a prospect, right? He he was he was going to be a game changer for a university, or or a league. Turns out the Big East was different because of Pearl. So when he said he was going to Syracuse, and then Al, Al McGuire makes the comment, "Oh, you're going up with all that snow?" We were like, "Shut up, man! Just let him talk." You know, <laughs> coming to Syracuse, you know, so. I remember I looked over at Jeannie Waldron because we were the point guards. He was started. I was back. I was like, things are going to change, man. You know, we better learn how to play too, right? We better learn how to shoot it a little better. So think we're going to change. And you felt it like you, you just felt it like it was going to happen. And then like you talked about when I met Pearl, like I said, I, I'm, you know, I, okay. And I was like, he's, he, he's just like anybody else. And we got along great. And he, he was shy. He was a little more reserved. I was expecting to see, you know, because he came in, he had that sheep's that sheepskin winter jacket with the big collar. Beaver was around a lot, so there was no doubt, you know. And he had, Beaver had the big Cadillac. And like, oh, okay, right. that's how they roll. I got it, you know. And and but that was not who he was. I mean, he was just he was with just the like, sweetheart. So go ahead, yeah. And he had the he had the Pac Man chain. Yeah, and he had the yes. chain. Had two yes. chains. Yes. Two big chains on. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, he's got two nicknames. All right, here we go. So. What do you remember, Wendell? Go ahead, Jane. Well, no, I have to remember that um, for his, one of his first games, our family, I mean, the whole na- the neighborhood came up on a bus. We came on a bus to come up and see him with that first game. And it was like, oh, my goodness, this is my little brother. And it was like he came on the floor, and it just ruptured into all this, oh, and I said, wow, we couldn't even imagine this of him. It was mm-hmm. like, it, it was unbelievable. And when we walked through Syracuse and we went to Marshall, is that the street? Mm-hmm. I would say, are you the mayor? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, was, he was more, everybody oh, yeah. coming out saying hello and, you know, doing this. He was I a said, rock star. You, you're the mayor of Syracuse, huh? Yeah. He was a rock star, no doubt. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I remember, I remember one of the first days of class, um, and even 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 prior to that, it, it you know, as a as a as a basketball player, one way or another, you're always passing through Manly, you know, to the basketball office, either to get something, do something, find something out, you know, look and see what's lying around food wise, um, and so you you know, one thing you know, every time you get there, there's there's TV trucks, you know, like. Wow, they were here yesterday. They're back today again. You know, coach is out there. And he's in the hallway. And he's you know doing an interview. And you're like, the fourth one this week. Well, you know, so you notice now that there's an air of excitement. You you notice that the air of expectation has risen. Yeah. The other thing that I noticed now, if you guys, if Sonny could tell you, we used to have this practice gear. It was, it, it was a reversible, and once it got wet, it was like saran wrap. And it was black on one side and it was orange on the other. And trying to get it off was like wrestling, wrestling Chuck. Yeah, it was a short sleeve cotton shirt. It wasn't right. even. Yeah. And once terrible. they put in the and once they put in the dry, it became a halter top. <laughs> and I think I think I think Pearl's first year, Sonny, right? It was when we got the, the Nike practice gear. Yep. The orange shorts, the orange. I mean, I think all the big East schools did. But all yeah. of a sudden now we had all this gear and we're like. Oh, Pearl get here. Now we get clothes. All right. <laughs> you know, we got, we got, we got, we finally legit. But well, remember Pearl that, too. He had his own sneaker. He was wearing, he was wearing a Pro Keds. Right. We were Nike. And I remember Bayham got in a little trouble. They're like, hey, listen, man, everybody's got to wear Nike, you know? 
So mm-hmm. I was like, man, he's got his own sneaker deal too. This is pretty good, you know. <laughs> he did. He did. You know. Yeah. But but again, humble humble to the bone. I and mean, whether's on campus, you know, in you know when you're walking with him, going on campus, traveling, whatever. I mean, people are coming out the woodworks and, and exactly. you know, stopping them left and right. And he, he had time. You know, he had time for everybody. He spent time, time on everyone. Time, everyone. You know, chat with kids, and you know, mm-hmm. made 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 their day. Made Imagine their what day. that would have been like if everybody had a cell phone camera in their pocket. Oh. That would have been nuts. <laughs> oh. It would have been nuts. You would have never got to anywhere. That's for sure. He was Pol- you would have had that box. <laughs> you had those instamatic pictures, you know. You take them and you got an instant picture, but and so, the film out. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the big moments he had. You know, you know, he changed the whole league. I mean, that we can honestly say, Elmer, you you hit it right on the head. You know, Chris Mullen, Eddie Pinkney, Patrick Ewing, Dwayne Pearl Washington. I mean, that to me is the Mount Rushmore of the Big East. Um, you know, especially. In the, in the formative years at the beginning of, of the conference. We can all agree on that. Um, but he saved his best performances, I think, for the bright lights of New York City at Madison Square Garden. I mean, there was nobody oh. better. at He owned that place, man. Oh. I mean, the games oh. that he had in there were incredible. I mean, and, and, the, and the electricity. Wendell and, and Sonny, you guys can talk to. We've talked about it numerous times, Sonny, on the show. I mean, but... You know, it, it is electric. And when, when people would come to the games and they know that Pearl Washington was playing against mm-hmm. Patrick or against, uh, against us or, mm-hmm. you know, against, um, you, know, the, you know, the Johnnies, it was always everybody, nobody was out getting drinks. When, when they threw the ball up, at, the place was full. Everybody was in their seats ready to go. Right, Sonny? Yeah. And you know what's, what's funny, Chuck? I mean, through that, even to this day, on on his passing it's at madison square garden his pitcher is on that marquee they they don't forget about it and i've been a few times since and if you talk to anybody that works in the garden or played like remember charles smith talked about when he sure. plays oh no 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 when pearl was here in the garden in college there was there's never been anything like it and that's and, and there's been some great basketball there. So that's yes, a pretty big compliment. And I, I, I fully believe that. One of the well, one of the things I noticed, play. yeah. Elmer? We, yep. When you have pro when you have pro players coming to the Big East, I mean, I remember one year, um, I forgot who was on the Knicks, but oh. there were like seven, there were like three or four Knicks players at the guard, and they were standing like in the, you know, in in the in the wing. In the walkway, right? right? In the tunnel. In the walkway, right. They wanted to see during the tunnel. But they're watching because again they know about him, and it was and it was actually against you guys, Chuck. It was against Villanova. It was like one of the um, like semi semi games, and um, I'm like, wow, you got pro play. You you normally you don't see pro players at a college game, you know. But this this was obviously different. This what were you gonna say, Elmer? It's funny, uh, Sonny, when you when you <laughs> it's the funniest thing when you talk about Madison Square Garden. And all the the magic that he's done and the memories that he's given so many people mm-hmm. at the garden. There was this one instance where, uh, you know, while I was helping coach at, uh, at at Boys and Girls, and we made it to the championship game, and uh, my my cell phone is ringing while you know the, our team is warming up, and you know I reach in my pocket and I look, and I see Pearl's name, and everything, and I pick up the phone, but I didn't hear anything. So I put my phone back in my pocket. My phone rings again. And it's Pearl again. And I go, hello, hello. And we find he's like, hey, he said, Elmer, it's me. I was like, I know what's going on, man. I said, you here? He's like, nah, I'm downstairs in the player's interest and they won't let me in. I'm like, <laughs> won't let you in. I said, did you tell them who you are? He was like, they won't, they won't let me in. I actually went in the back, got on the freight elevator, went downstairs to the player's entrance. And I looked at the lady and I said, this brother right here has Pat Madison Square Garden and you're not letting him in? You know, she looked at me, she's like, I don't know who a Pearl is. And I looked <laughs> at her and I laughed. And then the funniest thing, the, the uh, security guard, one of the security guards was like, Oh my God, you're Pearl Washington. 
And he was like, come on, let's go, let's go. And just escorted, escorted us up. But, but the point I'm making is it's ironic that here's a man mm-hmm. that, that packed the garden yep. for all these Literally. years and he couldn't get in to come and watch his high school play in the championship game because it was a young, it was a young attendant back there. And she didn't know, you know, she just didn't know, but it was just amazing. It's like, you have no idea who this person is mm-hmm. and what he's done at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. But it was, a, that was just a moment, you know, and everything and well, uh, I know he and I laughed about, about it. I know we're talking about what type of big person Pearl was. Uh, I got a couple of stories off the court. Now it's, it's dynamic and exciting as Pearl was on the court. There's a couple of people who would be very humble and he's very caring. He would always come back to boys and girls for high school after his after seasons over at Syracuse and once he got into the NBA. And he always came back and talked to the kids. And he gave a lot of free camps and clinics during the summer times into the ground for Benny for maybe something that. I want like Elmer and maybe he's mentioned a time out on five star basketball camp. Oh man. Make you all star team. Yeah, and, yeah. That was you tell the story, yeah. Elmer. You tell it. Well, you you know it, it's I look back and that I always get emotional with that. It was a situation where, you know, here it is, we're at the the best five star session, I think, ever. You're talking Reggie Williams, Muggsy Bogues, uh 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 Bruce Dalrymple, Mark Jackson, Kenny Smith, Pearl. I mean, it just was loaded. And uh and I'm on Muggsy Bogues team and we're playing well. And I, you know, I, I basically I was playing very well. And you know, one thing Pearl would always do, he would if he had a chance to watch one of my games, he would just he would come and watch and watch one of my games. So when they made the announcement uh, during breakfast at Five Star on the final day with the All Star team, you know, everyone thought because my team actually made it to the championship. Plus, I made it to the championship against Willie Glass in the one on one that they that they do at Five Star. So anyway. They make the announcement and I'm sitting there. My name didn't get called. So I go back to uh, those little cabins that they have out there. I get there and I'm literally in my room and I'm in tears. I mean, I, I you know, I'm keeping it real. I'm in tears. And uh, a, a friend of mine, who I'm still friends with, uh, Tim Briscoe, you know, uh, he's like, yo, it's going to be all right. All of a sudden, in come into the room, the little cabin is uh, Dwayne. He's like, Yo, what's up? I'm like, I'm cool, man. I said, how's everything, you know? And he says to me, he goes, listen. He said, yo, you playing in the All-Star game? I go, man, you was there. They didn't pick me. He's like, no, you playing in my place. I was like, you can't do that. I said, everybody's, he's like, you are playing in my place. They asked me if, if why, I'm going to say I, I'm hurt. And he gave up his jersey. And I, I did not want to play, but he was adamant. He was adamant. And this is what you're talking about, a guy who's the number one player in America and everybody's there to watch him. And he gave up his his uh, spot in the All-Star team because he felt that I deserved to be on that team. And I'll never forget that. I, I, I'll, I will absolutely never forget that. And uh, so, you know, I'm sharing that and I'm glad you mentioned it, Coach Brown. It was, it was, yeah. it, it was a selfless act and it's something that I've, I've incorporated or I've shared with my players, you know, act of being selfless. Sometimes yep. it's it's a bigger picture. And that to me is, and basically I probably got my scholarship, my scholarship offers from that all-star game because I played well. So he, he touched my life in a, in a lot of ways, man. But that was an unselfish act for the number one player in America. Well, he was like, he told everybody, he was like, and he told me, he said, I don't care. I'll tell them that I'm hurt. Wow. That was it. Yeah. He, he was the Don't consummate team player. That's that's the consummate yeah. team player right there. I mean, yep. he, he was one of the guys, and it, it, listen, a lot of guys, they say that, okay, he made his teammates better. There's only a few that have really actually made the guys around them better, and he was one of them. I mean, if you were open – you better be. You better have your hands up and catch the ball because it's coming oh, yeah. your way, right? I mean, especially on a, on a fast break. He got as much enjoyment at addition it to, Wendell or or Raff for a dunk to finish the play as he did taking it to the basket himself, right? I mean, that wasn't that. That's that's from my from my seat on the other side of the court. That's what we saw when we saw him play. 
Yeah, you talked was, about him was, being shy and stuff like that. You know, my brother never had a fight, or he really wasn't that kind of kid. Well, there was one. There was yeah, one. that's the one. I was getting ready to tell you one. about that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only time I've ever seen him in a fight mode was against Patrick Ewing. That was it. I said, that's the only fight that he ever had in his life. I've never seen him well, fight. <laughs> Pearl, got hit, Pearl got hit by Georgetown, and Pearl wasn't going to take it. So he, he put that. And most people didn't see the shot that he gave Patrick. Oh, he gave everybody him a good saw, elbow. Yeah. Everybody saw the swing Patrick took at him, and it just missed him. He pulled his head back. But they missed it. And, and you know, rightly so, right? When we got plenty of those bumps we played Georgetown, man. Oh, please. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't feel right if you didn't get elbow in the head. Or you know, end up two feet from where you were standing. But that was a, that was a name for the East. I mean, even I don't care who we played with, Boston College, UConn. You know, everything was a scrap, was a fight, and um, you know, it, it 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 was the essence. It was the essence of what the Big East was, and that's I think one of the things that um, that carried it on to this to this day is the the idea and, and the um, you know, <laughs> sometimes now you watch college games and it starts getting a little physical and chippy. You're like, really? Gosh, I mean, right, right. Well, that's nothing. You know, getting hey, close listen, line, man. getting close line, getting you know, elbow in the middle of your chest. Then you feel, yeah. then you feel some love. And yeah. you know what's crazy? Uh, I just want to say this: is I remember my freshman year, uh, and it was the Big East tournament and Atlantic Ten tournament, and you know, we're doing good. We make it to the uh, finals, but during but with the Atlantic 10, we wasn't getting prime time hours and everything. So the Big East tournament was going on. They play in the evening. And all I would get is phone calls, you know, or a message at the hotel. It's like, yo, Pearl is killing. He's doing this, doing that. So literally after every win, we actually made it to the conference finals against West Virginia when it was held in West Virginia. And uh, I remember every time we would win, I was like, yo, guys, hurry up, get dressed because I wanted to get back to the hotel yeah. because I wanted to catch his catch his game. So here it is. I'm in the in in my freshman year enjoying this moment, but in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I gotta go see my man play hmm. and everything. So it was uh it's amazing. Although hmm. I'm enjoying myself, but I'm thinking about how he's just lighting Madison Square Garden up and everything, uh, his freshman year. It was it was was insane mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, it was it was unbelievable and and to be able to play against them i mean we're, we're at the dome and i've told this story to sunny sunny knows and we're at the dome somebody's on the foul line and pearl's having a game he like he always did against us and uh he walks over to massimino and puts his arm around him and says don't get mad coach he's trying it's just he just can't guard me <laughs> but Rolly says Get the heck out of here, Pearl. You know? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so let's so let's now he he's he's gotten through Syracuse and he gets drafted number thirteen hey, in the first so. round that's, by the New Jersey Nets, right? That's funny. Talk about what that was like, Janie. You know, having your brother getting picked uh, to go play in the NBA. Oh, that was that was a dream come true for him. It was a dream come true for the family, you know, because. We were like the Jefferson. We're moving on up, right? <laughs> um, he, it was a great time. And um, what he did is he he did like most uh, players. He got a house for his mother and his family, you know, and that was one of the best things my mother and father had, you know, th their son was able to give them a house to move us out of the project, move them out of the project into a home. It was It was unbelievable. But he was never really happy. Wasn't Talk about happy. that for a second. What do you mean? He was never really as happy as he was in college and in high school. It wasn't, wasn't the same heart. It was something, I don't know, he, he missed. But um, it was never really the same, I think, once he went. To, he would he wanted to go to the NBA. That was his dream, and that's every kid's dream, right? You know, to get in the NBA. But it, it, I think he went to the wrong team. No, I don't think it was a good match, and he wasn't really happy there. And I think that that spirit that he had for playing and stuff just wasn't there like it was when he was in college and high school. You know, I felt it, and we saw it. 
Well, you know, that plays a lot on your psyche too, as an athlete. I mean, if you're not happy, if something's off, then usually everything's off at that point because that can get in your head at times, right, Janie? Yeah, it got in his head. I don't well, think he, he, he played the game with such joy and that's that yes. smile. And it was never, yes. it was never disrespectful. It was just that he just loved it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of uh, Elmer. Did you, were you, were you part of that process when that was going on? What well, do you remember? One of the things, well, I, I, I remember a great deal from this. Uh, I remember when he declared and right. uh, I get a phone call in the dorm, you know, in the dorm, you got to go to, you know, like the Superman phone booth, you know, your dorm floor and someone, you know, <laughs> run and tell you, they'd be like knocking on your door. Yo, you got a phone call. So I go and it's uh, someone from, uh, you know, the daily news and they're talking about, you know, what you, how you feel about, uh, you know, pro declaring, uh, you know, for the NBA draft, declaring hardship. And I'm like, wow. You know, in my mind, I'm like, wow. I said, and this was my teammate, you know, when you look back and, yes. and everything. And I was really happy because I always, Isaiah Thomas was the only guard whose picture I had in my room, Isaiah Thomas. And I remember saying to the, the reporter, I was like, you know, Pearl handles the ball better than Isaiah Thomas. I said, I look forward to seeing my former teammate you know, in the NBA playing and for him to be in New Jersey, not far from home. And it was an exciting, it was an exciting time for me. And I remember running into him. We were playing in the Empire State games and uh, I hit a car, <clears throat> pulls up. I believe if I'm not mistaken, I think it was a Pontiac Fiero. It was like a, a sports, you know, one of them fancy at that time, a Fiero was like, you know, you know, a special car. <laughs> and everything, you know, and uh, I remember him just, you know, asking his exact words to me. He was like, You good? You need anything? And I was like, I said, Nah, nah, nah. I said, I'm good, man. I'm happy for you. I'm excited and everything. And all I remember him doing was just shaking my hand. And I don't want to tell, you know, he put a few, you know, Benjamins in my hand and everything just out the blue. It's almost like he, it was his intentions to do that and give it to me like that. He was like, this for you. And, you know, I'm like shocked because nobody usually sliding no money in, in my hand unless when I'm, when I'm carrying bags and, and stuff on campus, when we have alumni come in and they give you a little $5 tip for carrying their bags up. But, but I, I'll never forget that. And, you know, that's when I was like, wow. I said, this is my high school teammate, he just handed me like $500 and everything. And, uh, you know, I, I look back, I was just, I wish I would have liked to have seen his NBA career uh, uh, be at a level that it was in high school and in college. But I think sometimes, you know, like Janie mentioned, the fun, and Sonny, you mentioned the fun that he had in high school and college, when you get to the pros, it's business. Yeah. And there's a different, and you go to 82 games for, as opposed to 30 games, maybe 35 if you make it to the finals and, it, and and that's it. So I, you know, that's how, that's how I look at it. I just, I just felt that maybe it became a little bit much the demand, the traveling, the practicing, the this, the that. And uh, and that may have taken the fun out, even though you, you're getting paid to do something you love. But right. I'm thinking that maybe the fun, you know, was take. I never asked him. I never, that's one thing. When he and I talk, we just talk, you know, about, it could be about the weather, about the girlfriend, how's this or whatever. But we never talked about stuff like that. I always respected his privacy and his personal business and all of that, because that's, that's the way we always were, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, but, you know, I, I just, you know, I miss them. You know, I, I miss the moments. I miss people standing outside, you know, at the high. Coach used to give us these little, look like meal tickets, but those was for the games. And I remember people, you know, used to want to buy those from us and everything. I'm telling you, people used to want to pay money just to get into our games in high school. There would be 300 people in the gym and maybe 500 outside 
it, 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 it was in, it was absolutely insane and and he was surely missed the excitement and uh everyone yeah. enjoyed him and that's why coach brown made this coach brown was brilliant coach brown was the ultimate businessman in terms of he knew the have our games done at nighttime because pa- adults was like yo y'all can't be playing at no four o'clock y'all gotta play at six seven o'clock Coach had us. We was one of the first, and really in the city, doing night games yeah, like that. Cool. And uh, yeah, coach, and we've never played like big games. I'm gonna stop real quick. But big games, we couldn't play at the high. We had to go to Pratt Institute, Long Island University. You know, coach knew how to put it together, man. And uh, and, and we went out we, to we out to Jersey a couple times to Trenton, New Jersey. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But outside in New York City. You know, he was definitely, he was definitely that, as they say right now, that dude. He was that dude back then and everything. And uh, and he knew it. And the number, and the one thing that I, I do miss, I we, I used to enjoy and I miss those moments. We used to eat hamburgers and all that stuff. But he used to have Chinese, he used to have chicken wings with fried rice. Somebody was always bringing him the good food and everything <laughs> while we, while we eat school lunch. And everything, uh, but he used to eat good, so it'd be like, "Yo, come on, let me get a wing," you know. But uh, you smell but, like you uh, smell wings, and you like, "Who got wings?" No, oh man, like so Omar eating ham sandwiches. I got, I gotta let you know, the statue of limitations is up. You're okay on the cash from Pearl. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not in trouble. Saint Bonnie's not in trouble. You're good. <laughs> Oh man! No, but I re you know I do remember one game um, at the high that was left a, um, a mark on me is that he made a move, the whole place erupted in all kind of yelling and screaming. One of the guys from I don't know where he came jumped on the court and ran all the way around the court yelling and screaming. <laughs> and saying, what? I mean, he it was like. He couldn't even contain himself that he was so excited that my brother had made this, this move that was unbelievable. He just ran all around the court like that. Just ran around the circle. You remember that one? That yeah, was the craziest yeah. thing I ever seen. Coach, Coach you remember that one? Yeah. That was the night one of the night games we had. I think it was against uh I think it was against was it Westinghouse was it on the division that year or no, I said, maybe it was Gates. It yeah. was it was so many so yeah. many exciting moments, man. Yeah, it was. You know that Our high school. Team. That's where it all started. I don't, you know, I know when he went to Syracuse, he he nationally he became, you know, a legend and 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 everything. But it all started. He bleed. Yeah. He, he he bled black and black and red early mm-hmm. on, and then of course you know you throw that orange and blue in there. So yeah. my man was definitely he was definitely special and. uh and that's why he's gonna always be remembered. Uh, I have a kid who father. I had some T-shirts for my my league, and I and I remember uh, putting his name on it, you know, out of respect, just you know, remember him. And one of my players' parents saw the shirt. He was like, he was like, oh my god. He was like, that was my favorite play. He says, Pearl yeah. is the reason why I started playing basketball. I was like, really? He was like, yeah. yeah. He says, listen, he is the reason I started playing basketball. So he touched a lot of lives, unbeknownst yeah. to him. He probably didn't even know. If he knew how many lives he touched. You know, unbelievable. Well, listen, yeah. guys, this has All been a joy and a pleasure for Sonny and I to have you guys here. You know, Janie, I have one other uh, thing I want to ask you, and then we'll we'll start to wrap this up. Tell us about the foundation that you're working with and and what you're doing. I know you are the keeper of uh, Pearl's, you know, legacy and his uh, his name and his um, his you know everything that he's done. You're keeping that alive. Tell us what you do about that. Talk about that for a minute. Okay, when my brother, when he was sick, I knew that um, you know he was really. I don't know, it was just overwhelming. But at the funeral, when we were at his funeral and I saw all the love and the respect and everything, you know, 
it just all it became overwhelming to me. And I said, I just could not let that go. I could not let his legacy just die. I didn't even know what to do. I'm a little teacher, you know? What do I know about? I'm, that was my brother, the basketball, famous basketball player. I'm a little high school, you know, assistant principal in the school. What do I know about that? But I saw it and I just knew I had to do it. So in 2006, he started an organization, Pearl 31 Inc. That was Pearl, he took his initials. And so, when I was with him, I realized that this was so important to him. I just couldn't let it go. So I, it's been five years I've been working with it. Wendell, thank you for coming out and helping me. Uh, Paul, Elma, everybody, Raphael, people came out and they really helped me in those years because I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to do something. And so Amy, give the name of the foundation school. again, because you broke up there for a second. Give All the right. name again. It's called Pearl 31 Inc. Foundation. And okay. the Pearl stands the P for providing, E for, you know, providing education and the A and revitalizing lives. That's, oh, that's what cool. Pearl meant. That's, that's, that's what it is. And 31, of course, was his number. Right. And so we, we, it, this is what was so important to him. He wanted to give back. He wanted to make a difference. He talked about it all the time. And, you know, at that time I was working and I couldn't do as much. But when I retired, it was something that just was, you know, timing. Everything happens at a certain time. It was timing. And I knew I just had to keep it going. Yeah. So we've been doing a lot of different things with the kids in the community. We do the summer league to, um, and, and different shirts and, and even uh, funding to take the kids to the um, museum, the basketball museum we went one year. And we were going to do a whole bunch of other things, but of course, COVID kind of right. yep. changed everything down, right? We were going to go to the African American Museum. We were going to do just take the kids and expose them to different things. That's um, great. Getting scholarships and you know for kids um, all over, not just in Brownsville. Brownsville was a stepping stone. That was where we were going to start, but we were yeah. going to go out like tentacles all over every area that needed that kind of support. But you know it's coming together slowly. Right. You know we're in our fifth year of me doing this. Um, we had, um, we had, we had some games in, uh, Brooklyn at Betsy Head Park. They renovated it and we did, um, we had the kids come out and, and people from the Brooklyn Nets came also, and they did training. And, um, of course when Wendell came, he, he, he also did some training with Raphael the first year we did it. So people have come down and, you know, like give a helping hand. And I really appreciate it. And Elma, the day when my brother was still alive, we did a fundraising and Elma was, you know, the spearhead to help that, you know, kind of move it along. And, I, you know, I, I appreciate everybody helping, but we are moving along and uh, this is going to be our best year. That's great. That's great news. Hey, Wendell, you, I'm going to give you the last word, pal. Give me, give me one, your final thoughts on, on playing with and uh, your friend uh, Pearl Washington. Um, again, a, a a true honor and 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 blessing. I say, um, apart from the basketball side that that we discussed thoroughly tonight, I think more importantly, his personality, his character, his his willingness to always extend himself to other people, and in his passing, as Jeannie just explained their foundation is an extension of that. And I think that is most importantly, um, despite basketball exploits, um, when, you, when, you, when you talk to people that know him, had time, who had the opportunity to get to know him and spend time with him, the, you know, they, they'll say he's a true friend. It's, it's, it's very easy to sit and talk and laugh about, and laugh with him and, and also about him. So I think with that, um, you know, he touched everyone in, in a special way. And again, I'm talking besides basketball, the time being being able to spend with him, seeing the genuine person that that he is, is is something that 
allows us to get together like these evenings and talk about him, you know, again, about the basketball, but again, the effect that he had on each of us. Yes. What, what a great way to sum it all up, Wendell. Thank you very much. I, guys, I can't tell you how enjoyable this conversation was for both Sonny and I to have all you guys come on and speak about Dwayne and, uh, and, and talk about his, not only his playing ability, and we all knew that. Anybody that watched TV back then and watched the games knew he could play ball, but talk about him as the person and the man that he was and how humble he was and everything. So thank you all very, very much for coming out and spending this time with Sonny and I on the Big East Rewind tonight. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Gone, but not forgotten. There, there it is. That's right. Gone, no. but not forgotten. Gone You've been listening to the Big East Rewind with Chuck Everson and Sonny Spera. The Big East Rewind was produced and directed by Nick Chico Chorus and Daryl Gurney. You can check us out on YouTube. If you go in and put Big East Rewind in the, in the bar, in the search bar, all of our episodes will come up. We ask you that you please like it uh, and subscribe and share it with your friends. Also, check us out on Twitter at Big East Rewind. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Have a great yeah. night. So, so, Janie, talk to us about Pearl's legacy and, and some of the things and how he's been honored uh, since his passing. Oh, he's been honored so many times by different organizations all over. Um, when he passed from, even from Syracuse, they were, they, the uh, legislature, they sent in a, a big proclamation when he passed. Um, one of the things I felt I wanted to do was to have a street named after him. Wow. This was, I didn't know where to start or how to start, but I knew this was something that needed to be done and it would really leave a legacy in our community. So with a lot of work and a lot of help from a lot of people in the community, we were able to get a street named after him right where we used to live. It's like around the corner. It's on the same block. In fact, the sign is it's really facing exactly where we live and i, I want to show that. you that she's going to show yeah, us the sure. I'd I'd love like to, it. yeah i'd like Let's to see, see it. that i've seen it before but this is pretty cool there it is you see it wow Dwayne, the pearl washington way, way. yeah that's cool. you know so that's great family, yeah an opportunity isn't that great to have right a, in brownsville right right in brownsville yes well, block away from where he was raised you know, where our family um, always kind of lived in the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we had that. Isn't that something? That's fantastic. That's fantastic. You know, that that says a lot right there. I mean, they named the street after him in, in New York City. That, that couldn't have been easy to get done in New no, York City. They don't do here. that except for very, very special, rare occasions, you know. I mean, well, so that, that's pretty cool honor. It was, it was quite a feat. We had to go around the whole neighborhood. We had to get the approval from everybody that lived in the neighborhood. We had to have a petition signed. I had to go before with my mother. We went before the community school board and you know, had to say why we thought he, was, he should have gotten a street named after him. We had to go to the city council. The city council had to approve it and it was happened. It happened. So now talk about talk about when you and your mom and the rest of the family came up to Syracuse in 2016 at the Georgetown game. There was a little celebration, a little dedication there. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, when we went <laughs> that 2016, my mother was she was so excited. She, you know, her face it was all lit, and she was saying, "My, you know, like my boy, that boy." You know, and the, the way people honored him and, and the respect that was given to him was unbelievable. I mean, it brought tears to all our eyes that, yeah. you know, someone thought that much of our brother, son, father, all that. It was really great. And it was, like you said, a real, well to put together, put together ceremony from right. A to Z. I mean, we had buttons, we had names, we had everything we had shirts we had everything and you know that you could think of to make it a wonderful memorable occasion 
did, and I did, said, go ahead. Did you know that it was going to be on the court or, or was that a little bit of a surprise? That I was halfway, I didn't know until later on when we actually went to the game and then they said, we're going to put his number on the court. What? <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness. Because they ripped up that, right? The DA was there and they pulled that up and it was like. Yeah, he went over there and pulled it up and it was, oh gosh. That's right. It was, it was really, you know, it was really crazy, Sonny, is, you know, and I've only seen this. I wasn't at the event. I wish I would have uh, been able to go, but there was 31 seconds left in the half yep. and the score was 31 to 31. Now, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. that goes you beyond, you. you know, <laughs> you couldn't have written that, Sonny. Right. You know, I mean, this, is, right. This, this is true, right, Chuck? This is true. This is a description of that exact thing. They call us out. Listen, we're going to get ready. We're going to do this at halftime. You got to get down. You got to get home. So we're all standing just off the court, all the, the players in our yeah. little area. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, 32,000 people. It's hard for them to be quiet. It starts to quiet little by little. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I have goosebumps right now talking about it. I remember looking at Gene and some other people. And I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't say a word. I just said, look up there. And they did. And the score was, and it was 31-31. Yes, yes. For a while. Yes. Yeah, it was for a while. And you knew that he was there. I mean, I, I'm telling you, he was in the building. He was right there. It was surreal. It was a moment was, that transcends our understanding. So I'll never it forget it. And and you got the whole the, the whole family coming out on the court and you know giving the award. I have it in my house now, you know yeah. the award. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was yep. to my mom, but I, you know, I yep. kind of your mom's in the your mom's in the wheelchair. We handed yep, to you. That's yep. right, my mom. And Raph, yep. Yeah, every everyone was there. All the people that was in his life that made yep. Syracuse a very special place for him. Yeah, he had another and home in Syracuse. You know? And Sonny, you spoke, right? You I spoke did. to the event. I did. They, <laughs> John Wildhack says to me before the game, oh, yeah, by the way, we want you to uh, welcome the Washington family. I said, <laughs> you're telling me now? <laughs> oh, and, and here's a couple things you got to hit. I was like, <laughs> so I got to put a speech together. I got to make sure. So, so literally, and I mentioned that moment because I just remember that feeling. I said, I just told everybody, didn't you just feel him being here? You know? Yeah. Yes. Well, let me, let me ask you this guys, you know, you know, so they put the, they put Pearl's number on the court where he made that famous half court shot. Yep. Right. And that, awesome. that stayed for like a year or two. Right. Yeah. And yeah. now, and then it was removed and they put all the retired numbers up in the rafters. Now yeah. there's a movement. Now there's a movement going on started by uh, fans and, and, and uh, people that loved Pearl sports and, writer, yep. you know, sports writers, coach B is involved. They want to put the number back on the court. Yep. Talk, tell me, talk to me about your feelings about that, Janie. I mean, I mean, as I, as a, as a player that, that was a, uh, an opponent of Pearl's and a friend. I mean, I, I think that that's where it belongs. What do you guys think? You, you know my feeling, Janie. You go ahead, Janie. You go ahead. Absolutely. I think it needs to be a return. And I think with the return would be a, a, a spiritual awakening. You know, it would be like he came home again. You know, he yeah. went and he came back. And I think that's in, so very important, especially because Syracuse was his other life. Yeah. He had a life. And Syracuse played a big part in it. So to yeah. have him yeah. return to the place that he loved so much would, would be so overwhelmingly happy for the whole family that he would, you know, it's a homecoming. It's yeah. just like getting the, your street named, you know, yeah. it's the yeah. same kind of feeling, you know, we got the street name and everyone's happy and you actually see it happen and, and the number is on the floor and, you know, it's like, wow, yeah. that'd be Can another reason to have a party. Janie, well, what do you think? What do you think Pearl's legacy is? I mean, now he's gone. This is coming up on the on the fifth, fifth anniversary. You know, what do you, what do you think his legacy is? Is it is it is playing? Is it his humanitarianism? His the way he dealt with the kids? Because I know he was great with the kids. I've seen it in person myself. What do you think his legacy is? And and 
where do, where as the keeper of that talk about that as as uh, a, a job is that a, just the labor of love for you i'd imagine it would be oh, or is it, it or is it something that you got to work at every day no it is a labor of love and all of the above is right it's like something his whole nature is something from within his heart he wanted to do he started right. an organization in in 2006 and he really wanted it to go or you know he had laid everything out for it to be he wanted to be one that offers education education was very important because he knows what education did for him recreation yeah recreation is important all of that he wanted to be the you know leadership having something to give back to the kids so they can move on and i think his legacy and i'm really pushing it for the kids to understand it's not about so much the game the game of basketball opened up his world for him but you know to make kids know that you may not be able to be a pearl but you can you can move you can do almost anything if you have someone that cares like my brother did for you he yeah. wanted to give back to his neighborhood he saw the need for to having someone and if his name could be used as a a a flashlight or a light for others yes this i do as a labor of love i love my little brother so much and i just realized that i could not let what he was feeling just dissipate I had to make sure that it lived on and that kids understand that you too can do something. You too can be something. You too can go on and give back. That's so important. And my brother wanted to give back. Yeah. No well, let me tell you, that. Jenny, we are going to put all our might and force behind it and try to and we our effort and coach B is fully supportive because after all the coach it's coach's course named in his honor yes he recognizes the significance of pearl to the program the university and really what that point on the court means way more than just that's where a shot happened it really represents right. his influence so he's all behind it we're going to get a bunch of people and and we're going to see if we can get a little momentum to get that put back where in my opinion where it belongs. Yeah, I, no I concur with you on that, where it belongs. That, mm -hmm. will, that will be a light for other people to see, you know? Yeah. You know, Great. that's a big court, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big house, that's right. So Janie, we were talking about Pearl's legacy. So I know you're working real, real hard. Tell us a little bit about your foundation that you founded about Pearl. I didn't really find, he did, I'm just, I'm just a keeper okay. of the flame, okay? Right, right. Uh, <laughs> what what it is is um, it's a community-based organization aimed at helping kids and youth in need of direction, supervision, love, um, academic support, all the all the things that they need to to mature as adults. Education is important. So all these things, it's one of our focus uh, uh, that he had put together, focus of the organization is to provide education and recreation, count, you know, counseling, um, all the things that kids will need to, to, to move forward in life. To now, have a chance at success coming out of yeah, you know, difficult uh, places, exactly. right? Right. And so one of the things is we wanted to do uh, scholarships for kids you know help them you know, well you know in kids like him he wasn't a great academic person let's be for real it, it was tough but there's a lot of kids like him that need support so they can move forward like some kids will always be able to do it and other kids they need a helping hand and yeah. part of that it would be the nomination of you know scholarships based on kids like him, not the kids that will automatically get it because they got high scores and stuff like that, but we need the kids that need it, mm -hmm. like borderline kids who need yep. that extra little help to get them over the hump. That's, That's great. Cool. Where, where can somebody, if they want to donate to the, to the foundation, where can they do that? All right. Our home is in Brownsville 
uh, with a organization that helped me to get my 501c3 and everything like that. So it's, um, it's the Pearl 31 Inc. Foundation in care of Central Brooklyn Economic Corporation. And it's 444 Thomas Boylan Avenue Street, I'm saying, in Brooklyn, New York, 11212. It is a community-based organization that really helped me along those, those dark times when I was trying to figure out what to do. Of course, I didn't know what to do when you start an organization or continuing a, or starting a foundation, but this organization helped me. So they've been kind of like, you know, the mother hand over me, you know, they helped me through those areas. So this organization helped Pearl 31 Inc. Foundation to grow. Um, so Pearl, Pearl, Pearl 31 INC. Foundation. Foundation. Yes. Okay. And um, this way, the, in fact, that organization helped me to get kids in the neighborhood to go around getting um, getting uh, petitions signed and everything like that. They went from building to building to help me when I was doing the naming of the street. And I, I want to know that there's something the foundation do every year. And that is we have a summer league where we have a, a basketball tournament. Um, and that basketball tournament allows kids from all over Brooklyn to participate in. And um, I showed I have to say that the Brooklyn Nets have been very, very supportive of me in a lot of ways. They have given shirts and they have, um, you know, sent out people when we did the street naming, they sent some of their work, the, their performers to perform in the park where we were having the um, celebration. Um, They've given um, opportunities for the kids to go to see the games and everything. So the Brooklyn Nets have been very supportive of Pearl 31 Inc. Foundation. And I, you know, I really appreciate that. And I told them I was going to put a word in for them. Okay. There you go. Great well, stuff. You know, you guys saw it, you guys saw it up on the screen. So we encourage everybody to participate with whatever you can to help out. It's for a great cause, and uh, it's in memory of a great guy and a great basketball player. So, and, we, and we'll put it in the show notes for the podcast as well. Correct. Thank you very much. So I really Janie, thank you it. again for joining thank us. You, dear. It was so oh. awesome that you came down and, uh, and, and hung out with Sonny and I. So All thanks right. again. One, one more thing. Sure. We're going to be moving soon on that space, right? That little spot in that court that says 31. Oh. Yeah, oh, we're gonna we're gonna get it going. We already got right. we already got some momentum going. So right. okay. he's That's got right. the he's got the boss involved. It's a matter of time, Jane. The boss is involved now. Well, you know, he's only been the coach there forty five years. I think he's got right. some clout, right? right? Forty five years. Yeah. That's the house he built, huh? He That's the house it. that Pearl built. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what? And that was that was his guy too. Pearl was uh, Coach B's guy. There's no doubt about that. I mean, yes. So. He knows he, he knows how work. much Pearl meant to not only his career but the um the, the dome and Syracuse University basketball. There's no no uh, doubt absolutely about it. So, that we're all tied in together, right? It's that's all right. together. You You're know, right. you, it's a fist, not a <laughs> finger, it. right? You gotta have a fist. <laughs> a fist is stronger than a finger, right? That's, that's right. And if we work like a fist, we'll make things happen. I thank you all guys. <laughs>